So just to set the stage, I'm going to lay down a couple of observations that we've made and then we'll try and prove our points to you folks. First off is that uh, tourism is a gateway for Aboriginal entry into the world of business and that means that because tourism is a relatively low barrier, low capital kind of business, folks who are not um, uh, experienced in business can get into it and start to learn what they're doing. So it gives them a chance to get into business and start to understand how things work and then move on to other lines of business. Another important point is that in today's world, Aboriginal culture is hot. It's very much in demand. Uh, surveys of incoming visitors have told us that uh, Aboriginal culture is one of the most important things that they want to see when they come to visit British Columbia. And finally, these Aboriginal communities, these Aboriginal people, own and control many of the really important key resources that are of importance to tourism, the places and the culture, the kinds of things that people want to get to. Things like uh, waterfront properties, um, beaches, trails, scenic areas, and they also, um, in terms of business development, have, um, have access to different kinds of supports than are available to the standard business community and sometimes by working partnerships together. Uh, there's a lot that can be gained by Aboriginal folks and non-Aboriginal folks working together. Okay, there's a lot to be gained, but how do we do it? Well, first to tell us a little bit about how important tourism is and why we should use tourism as one of our gateways for economic development, uh, we'll ask Walt Judas to explain a little bit about the Aboriginal tourism industry. Thanks, Walt. I'm just going to flip screen control over to you now so we can look at your PowerPoint deck. Perfect. Thanks very much, Bruce, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Just going to pull up this uh, slide deck here that has a lot of tourism stats and uh, some context on the Aboriginal tourism sector as well as an overview of uh, what this sector is and what it represents, the profile of the Aboriginal tourism uh, visitor, and then a bit about the Aboriginal tourism opportunity in the province. So let me first of all start with the overall BC tourism landscape, which is represented by about 19,000, it's a little more than that, but small businesses spread throughout all regions of the province. There are 270,000 plus employees that work for tourism businesses in BC, about half of whom directly service the visitor economy, meaning there would not be that many employees if there were not any visitors that uh, frequented these businesses. The industry is growing. It's growing rapidly and the combination of people retiring uh, from working in the tourism industry to new businesses being created to young people uh, wanting to enter the business. You can see here the stat, there's a projected 100,000 new workers that will be needed within the tourism industry in British Columbia by the year 2020. So there's plenty of opportunity there. Recently I was in a meeting with uh, Minister Shirley Bond who has tourism as part of her portfolio and she suggested that between film, high tech and tourism, they were BC's strongest performers in 2015, were it not for those three business sectors, we would have struggled in the province to be sure. The visitor economy is larger than agriculture and forestry and continues to grow. And to look at some of the stats over the past couple of years, in particular this past year, a record 5 million international overnight visitors in all parts of the province. You can see here are some of the statistics. Most notably is an increase in U.S. visitation, largely attributed to the dollar to be sure, but there are other factors. There's more confidence by Americans in their economy. There's pent up travel demand. Canada is a safe and easily accessible uh, place to come and we certainly welcomed our fair share of U.S. visitors here. It is still our largest international market in British Columbia. Some other key stats worth noting, YVR, 
there were passengers and planing and deplaning at YVR that totaled over 20 million. That's a record, the first time that's ever happened. That was up 5% from the previous year. You see with BC Ferry passengers, they carried more people and more vehicles. So lots of upswing on the tourism side this past year. There are the revenues, about $14.5 billion in revenue in 2015. The real GDP, $7.1 billion. Aboriginal business now, if you look at the landscape for Aboriginal tourism in the province, uh, $561 million in GDP, and that number is growing as well. Aboriginal businesses paid about $12 million in tax revenues to the province. Further stats, and I, I apologize there are so many of them, but you'll see uh, some of this for future reference as well. To give you an idea of what the sector generates in terms of revenues, it's in the range of 45 to 50 million. There are several studies on this. It could even be much, much higher. This could be a conservative number, but it's uh, taken from one of the, the, the studies that I recently looked at. There are 1,500 Aboriginal tourism businesses across BC, 300 of which, or about 20%, are in British Columbia, and they represent, at the moment, uh, a small percentage of tourism businesses in all of the province, but as I've referenced a couple of times, have great potential uh, for growth. You can see here that the majority of them are doing very well. They've retained or increased revenues over the past three years. Uh, more than half have been in business for 12 years, so these are well-established tourism businesses in the province. 61% of them operate year-round, so that shows a good number uh, have operations that employ people year-round and that are prepared to welcome visitors at any time of the year. They employ, on average, about eight full-time staff and fully 67% are operated, owned and operated by Aboriginals. Last year, there were 3.7 million visitors to Aboriginal businesses in BC. Now, to be fair, much of uh, the visitation are people who are adding the experience on versus the sole purpose for travel, meaning they've discovered that while they're in British Columbia, there are Aboriginal experiences to be had, and therefore they choose to participate in them, and that's a good sign. And I think that's going to change in future too. It could be as there is further Aboriginal product being developed throughout the province, that will become a primary purpose for travel and not necessarily an add-on. Here you can see that the majority of visitors to Aboriginal tourism operators or businesses come from other parts of Canada, from within the province, certainly Alberta and Ontario. Those are the largest visitor markets for uh, people traveling to British Columbia. But from the U.S. and Europe, also we see strong visitation to Aboriginal businesses. The experiences, that is, what are people trying to do while they're here and they visit uh, an Aboriginal operator? They look for performances, certainly displays, the events, uh, and the tours. The, the profile of uh, an Aboriginal uh, experienced visitor, the majority tend to be female. They're middle-aged to senior, they have high disposable income, and they're highly educated. And if you look at the profile, and this is obtained through Destination Canada and some of the work that Destination British Columbia does, I'd venture to say they fall into the category of a cultural explorer. And this is what the definition of a cultural explorer is. They're defined by their love of constant travel, they're looking to immerse themselves in the culture. They love meeting people. They uh, appreciate the settings of the places that they visit. They're non-traditional. They're enthusiastic. They're described as creative. And they believe that other cultures, namely in this case Aboriginal tourism, has a lot to teach them. They like 
the element of surprise. Uh, they like being enriched by unexpected circumstances. So they don't necessarily know what to expect when they visit an Aboriginal business, but they love experiencing whatever that business has to offer. And they think that trying out new things is pretty thrilling. So once we expose them to the Aboriginal tourism opportunity and they take that in, uh, they quite enjoy it and will likely tell their friends or return to British Columbia. So here's the, the opportunity and I'm on the last part of the presentation. There are 200 First Nations bands in BC, give or take, approximately a third in all of Canada. They have seen growth in this sector uh, of about 100% over the past five years. So that's what I was referencing earlier about the opportunity. There's been tremendous growth and there will be more growth in future and it largely depends on not only promoting and marketing those experiences but certainly introducing new products and opportunities for people to experience around Aboriginal tourism in BC. So there is a, a projection of moderate growth in the coming year. And finally, I end by uh, TIA BC. We're an advocacy organization. We certainly have done lots of work with First Nations advocating on their behalf around transportation issues. Uh, we do a lot of communicating and, and to a degree, some marketing around the experiences, but we're working with all sectors and regions on destination development, providing the framework and the context and the opportunity to further develop Aboriginal tourism products and experiences in BC. So thank you for that. Looking forward to your questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Walt. Really appreciate it. Um, if, uh, if there are any questions for Walt right off the bat, feel free to uh, type those in or raise your hand just as we get set up to uh, Bruce's presentation. I'm just going to flip over there. Bruce, uh, you should have screen control shortly. And uh, I will invite uh, Craig and Lily to come back um, to present those slides. Mm. And uh, Craig and Lillian, if you guys are there, um, I think I've sent you an invite to turn on your webcam. Uh, if you don't see that, feel free to just hit that webcam button so we can uh, see you again. Okay. How's that? Perfect. There you are. And just before we get started, we've just got uh, one question here. Um, from uh, Jaylene uh, to Walt. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation, Walt. Are you willing to share your slides following the webinar? Yes, absolutely. Great. Okay, so Walt, if you uh, if you share me those slides, I'll make sure that they're uh, put up on our uh, on our website along with a recording of this webinar today. So uh, I am seeing a few uh, other questions come in for Walt, but I think now that we've got uh, Craig and Lillian with us, we'll flip over to their presentation and we'll uh, get to it first thing uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, Lillian, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Hello there. Um... I'm Lillian Hunt. I was born and raised in my village of Alert Bay. I am Namibi's First Nation. Uh, and we are the Kwakwakiroq. The region is on the northeast coast of Vancouver Island and over on the neighboring mainland. What's that? Is that dinging coming from you guys? No, it's my cell phone. Okay. So, <laughs> as, you can see, as you can see by this screen, there's some, um, you know, general information about Aboriginal tourism being hot and growing and doubling operators and revenues. Um, the tools at BC, Aboriginal Tourism Association of British Columbia, has the tools and programs to help with product development, skills development, and marketing. Um, in at BC is the First Nations Run and Manage Tourism Destination Man Management Organization in BC. And uh, we are tasked with growing uh, the contribution of Aboriginal tourism to the provincial economy. The data for 2015 is in India, although we know it's going to be a record high. All these stats will always be available on our websites, including the destination. British Columbia websites. 
Now, in 2014, a study was based on 2012 data, and it showed tourism businesses in BC have doubled their number and revenue in the six years since 2006. Aboriginal tourism is still a niche player in tourism, but its iconic status gives us worldwide brand recognition that can benefit all BC business. Uh, Aboriginal Tourism BC has created a number of tools and programs to help with this, including um, some of our um, initial uh, reason for at BC was a marketing program. We've developed some uh, unique marketing initiatives, in, uh, to especially to partner with non-Aboriginal business. Lillian, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just getting some feedback from some folks on the line that you're a little hard to hear. So if you're able to maybe just speak up a little bit, that uh, that would be appreciated. Thanks. Okay, how's that? That sounds better. Okay. Thanks. And uh, a, a lot of this information is available on the website for anybody that misses anything or they can, you know, for sure ask at the, uh, uh, put their hand up. So, um, we have tools to protect the culture, as you can see here, authentic Aboriginal tourism products that we've developed through at BC. And these, when we were going through this uh, process, this was uh, something that we did in direct, uh, um, directly with the First Nation communities that were interested in establishing First Nation product. Uh, at BC is, as, is merely the um, uh, association and we identified right from the very beginning that in order to move forward with some First Nation uh, protocols that we needed to, to work directly with the communities and so that's very important to anything that we do in Aboriginal tourism uh, because at the heart uh, of our Aboriginal tourism programs is our own local in. Aboriginal fair, fair deal autistic programs. One is for our true products and the other one is for arts and crafts. We had to identify this early on because we felt that we found that one model didn't suit the entire authentic Aboriginal program. At BC introduced a program that certifies the authenticity of the Aboriginal content of the product. <clears throat> With the authentic, authentic Indigenous program, at BC, make sure the artists who create arts and crafts are fairly compensated for their work and protected from fake or imitations. Okay, next slide shows the map that was developed uh, particularly for Umista Cultural Center in Le Bay, uh, which represents the full territory of the Kwakwaka speaking nations, as you can see from this slide. We reckon this was this was actually developed before any kind of tourism program was developed for our area. But it recognizes the need for partners on the Aboriginal side, the challenge and opportunity with First Nation culture, working with the neighbors, starting with the Willamola Accord with Nimmo Bay, and working toward mutual support. So authentic Aboriginal and, and Indigenous are as good, are good as a start, but there's much more potential to Aboriginal tourism. Uh, Aboriginal tourism businesses need external partners to connect with markets, to bring in specialized skills, and to gain access to the skills and capital needed to build new businesses. And this is what we found individually in our own communities and what we've been able to bring to the table uh, at Aboriginal Tourism BC, the association, so that all the communities will have an opportunity to um, uh, participate in these programs. The communities have a long tradition of hospitality and sharing, of course, as in the case of the potlatch, but lack expertise running business. And I have to say at this point, uh, I meant to point out in the very first slide that a potlatch is not considered a tourism product, but certainly uh, what we do offer in our community, such as what I do when, when we host uh, visitors, is to um, share the history of that ceremony and how important it is to the survival of our people. 
So to meet um, business needs, Aboriginal communities are reaching out to our neighbours, to business people like my friend here, Craig Murray of Nimmo Bay Resort. As it shows on the next slide, the case, a case, the case, the Willamola Accord. Uh, in Alert Bay, home of the Umista Cultural Centre, as I mentioned earlier, we were approached by uh, Craig Murray, who wanted to provide his high-end guests with exposure, and, and Craig, I'll let you talk about that. So this is what started the Willamola Accord um, on that fateful day, sometime before 2004. Because as you can imagine, uh, every great idea uh, needs a special amount of time and a certain amount of funding to support um, the survival of, of, of this uh, Nimmo Bay Accord for sure. Um, so the agreement between the Aboriginal communities and non-Aboriginal business neighbours certainly began in, in our region. So this accord lays out principles of fair dealing, respect and working toward mutual benefits. Since its introduction, the Willamola Accord has been a cornerstone in new relationships and local businesses. Working together, First Nations and non-Aboriginal communities are stronger, particularly in remote and rural areas, such as our home on the North Island. And of course, what we found within uh, BC, most First Nation communities, there are a lot of remote First Nations. This tourism partnership in particular has helped in the formation of partnerships around all manner of resource and development activities from gravel pits to sea farming by demonstrating a successful model of being able to work together. And uh, this is the initial introduction to the case of the Willamola Accord and Craig from Nimmo Bay will carry on. Thanks Lillian. Uh, on or about 2004, does where it does it and how it does it, and we decided that we could add a really great cultural element to our business by approaching First Nations folks to see if we can interest them in tourism and show them how tourism could be a great economic generator, especially for the out-of-the-way villages that are in uh, our area, and there's, as Lillian said, quite a few of them. Uh, our closest First Nations neighbor is a little village called Hopetown, and it's in the Great Bear Rainforest on the mainland of Canada, about seven miles from us. Henry and Julia Speck live there with their kids, and so we started that relationship 36 years ago with them, and it's been building ever since, and we've become great friends. Um, and through a series of um, trips we put on for First Nations folks. Uh, we tried to show them um, what the non-Aboriginal brand of tourism looked like, uh, using helicopters and all kinds of crazy things like that, flying throughout 50,000 had never really experienced their territories before to that extent. But we thought it would be a great idea just to mm, ignite some fire, see what could happen. Uh, Nemo Bay has been in the area now, on the mainland, where we're located, up in Mackenzie Sound. We're going to into business. Um, my son, uh, Fraser, is uh, looking after the business. My daughter looks after all the guest services and wedding ambassador, because he's one of the Canadian tenors. And so everywhere he goes in the world, Nemo Bay and the mainland, and all our experiences get, uh, get talked about on the stage before um, he does his presentations. Um, so at 36 years of tourism in the area, uh, it's taken uh, a while to develop um, tourism as a, a product with the Willamola Accord. And, um, um, and the biggest drawback we found was uh, a cultural opportunity on that. But back in 2004, I approached Lillian, Randy Bell, Andrea Sanborn, Bruce got involved, and we came up with this uh, 
Willamola Accord. And Willamola in uh, the Kwakwaka'e language means we are all traveling together. It's really simple. It has to be all partnerships to make it work. And that's what we found out. So partnering with First Nations was a, a no-brainer um, because we're traveling in their territory and we both have opportunities to offer each other. So we came up with the Willamola Accord and we've been uh, trying to put that into practice ever since. Um, and um, we as a non-Aboriginal business benefit greatly because of the incredible settings and territories we get to travel in and take our guests in. And we have gone to several villages in the area and <clears throat> so our guests and the First Nations people in Alert Bay and Guilford and Hopetown, different places throughout the area, Kinkham Village. Um, so we've tried to uh, really look after that partnership with First Nations. And this is a, a, a plan that could work anywhere in Canada um, if people had the um, wherewithal to do that. Um, so we just continued working together. And we are still working together till this day. Um, hmm. Respect and courtesy is a big deal for both sides. And after a while, it becomes a friendship and a family as opposed to just a business relationship. Because you get to understand who you're working with and why you're working with them. And you get to understand looking after the environment, which is the cornerstone of the Willamola Accord, is the underlying factor that makes it all work. Because um, uh, our business, any business, is a subsidiary of uh, the environment. Because without an environment, we don't have very much at all. So up here in this area, we're blessed with air to breathe, water to drink, and scenery beyond belief, wildlife, and great people. So it's a winning combination. And putting all that together, uh, tourism can only stand to benefit from that. Um, and tourism is about hospitality. And First Nations have been a very hospitable people for 10,000 years since the last ice age. And uh, hospitality is about creating a free space where transformation can happen naturally. And First Nations are all about transformation. Um, and hospitality is also offering the guest friendship and freedom of space without leaving them alone. And that's key. Um, it's People want to be led, they want to be taught, they want to be educated and they want to be told uh, all about the new environment that they're in. So it's critical that we uh, take control and do that. Uh, because hospitality is an attitude of the heart. So you have to have some care and consideration for, for people to move through this program. And uh, hospitality recognizes we're all traveling together, just as the Wheel of Mola Accord says we do. Um, so I think I'll just leave it there, and I'm going to pass it over to Bruce here. And Bruce is, and Lillian are going to talk on behalf of uh, our friend Randy Bell. And um, Bruce? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so our, our next uh, speaker was to be Randy Bell, but uh, uh, Randy's a well-respected fellow, but he's gone fishing. Uh, I want to quickly point out that this is not like uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn skipping school and going fishing, no. This is an important part of his uh, culture and community, and maybe Lillian can tell us a little bit about the Ulican or the Tlina. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> Certainly the most valuable item that's con it's considered the most valuable, highest uh, gift that you can actually give for the uh, to receive from the hereditary chiefs, who are the only ones with permission to host these ceremonies. So this uligan uh, is harvested 
up in a beautiful, beautiful region that we call Zawadi. And uh, this is a, is a long process. And uh, Randy is very fortunate that he gets to go up there this season. Uh, I'm sure he goes every year. Uh, but the really valuable thing about um, Randy participating is because he heads up the youth cultural youth program. This is uh, something that he's been working on for several years now, is to engage any of the youth and taking them out into our traditional territories and continuing with the teachings of traditional harvesting. This is crucial to our survival in our communities that we still have access to some of these foods. As you can imagine, not, not all our people get to go up into these beautiful areas and harvest this again. So um, this is very, uh, like it says, a very valuable source of our food. So Culture Youth in the Future, this is what the program that Randy heads up for our community. Uh, this is definitely something that we um, encourage uh, in, in any community. Um, it's uh, fairly new in Alert Bay, but um, it's getting stronger every year. So Randy, Randy Bell, as you saw in the pri previous picture, is the director of training with our Numbers First Nation in Alert Bay. And it's his job to help the young people fit into a modern world while still um, accessing the teachings of our old ways. So um, culture is a doorway for understanding. On our side, it helps First Nations understand heritage, feel more comfortable in our skin, and better able to take on meaningful roles in modern society. <clears throat> for non-Aboriginal people, the First Nations culture can be a gateway to understanding themselves in their world. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the base, the foundation for Aboriginal tourism. <clears throat> people from big cities all over the world see that First Nations have held on to some of the ancient ways of living ways of living that look pretty darn attractive to our modern, busy, technology-driven civilization. This is certainly what we found to be true in Alert Bay. Uh, Randy's work in Alert Bay uh, centers on helping the youth find their way in the modern world. One of the most interesting projects we've undertaking, undertaken is the revival of the Uligan Grease Trail between the Numgees territories at Was Lake, and this is all on northern Vancouver Island, and the New Channel territories in Nootka Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. By taking youth out onto the land and showing them how their ancestors lived, by making those traditions come alive, we help young people understand their identity. These same experiences are highly sought after by visitors from around the world. And again, this I go back into my training. This is something that we found out at the beginning of our developing our tour programs. To make it happen to reach these global markets, we as First Nations have to work in partnership with businesses. Well, we certainly find that working with non-First Nation business partners like my friend Craig, at Nimmo Bay is definitely uh, a valuable uh, step that we, we're, we're happy to take. <clears throat> so under the Wheel of Momola Accord, people from our nation began doing guest performances for um, Craig's clients out at Nimmo Bay. This is a beautiful picture to have been a part of the initial Willamola program where I got to go out and visit Nemo Bay, but you can see the stunning, stunning backdrop provided to our beautiful uh, cultural programs that Randy heads up with the youth and uh, partnering with dance directors of the Tasaha dance group headed by Andrew Kramer. To get to this point where we can make a partnership work, we, ha we had to learn how to work together. As Craig uh, pointed out very truthfully, it's respect on both sides that leads us to a, uh, an understanding of each other's cultures. But original cultures, how you do things is, is, off, is, is often more important as what we do 
the secret to developing a long-lasting and meaning relationship with First Nation is to understand our protocols. As Bruce pointed out at the beginning of the introduction, uh, sharing that information when he first, first visited us in Alert Bay, he was lucky that I was one of the first people that he actually ran into. So, protocols are a set of rules for sharing, learning, and working together in the Rula Mola Accord um, captures this. However, we as First Nation people have been developing protocols for thousands of years in our traditional territories, and these are well documented in the potlatch ceremony. They vary from place to place. This is very important to understand that the protocols that we uh, enjoy in Alert Bay may be uh, very different than uh, protocols that you would uh, experience elsewhere. And each nation is uh, absolutely uh, responsible for each of their own protocol ceremonies. Uh, in every community, there are elders and keepers who, who keep track of the information on the protocols. But as non-Aboriginal business people, um, the thing to do is find the expert on these protocols. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to find anybody with a phone number, I would highly encourage it. However, um, in this modern day world, taking from 2000 and then 2004 when the Willa Mola was de uh, first developed, and now here we are in 2016, there are certainly a little bit more of uh, an easier way to contact these experts in each of their villages. So in the end, it all comes down to respect, Mayahala in our language, be honest, be fair, and you will find First Nation partners who return your respect and treat you honestly and fairly and are happy to share uh, our knowledge on our individual protocols and invite you and welcome you to work with us. Gaila Kasla. Bruce. Yeah. A little story time now. Go ahead. We break the protocol and tradition. Everybody loves stories. Uh, when we did the first Willa Mola Accord trip, we had three helicopters on board. We had uh, a lot of First Nations folks. And uh, every day we'd set out from Nemo Bay and we'd basically follow the grease trail. And the grease is what they harvest from the hooligans, the fish. And it's worth its weight in gold, probably more. And they use it as a trading mechanism for the uh, folks on the West Coast as well. Back in early, early days, they traded women and dentilia shells and sea otter pelts and all kinds of stuff for uh, this Uligan grease. So we wanted to follow the grease trail to give people an idea of what was in the territory and how important the grease was as a, as a trading commodity. So that basically was set the scene for the next three days. So we ended, we started the uh, the whole venture in the, up the head end of the Clean and Clean River, which were dumps into Night Inlet, and that's where the hooligans are are being fished right now by Randy. There's a whole team of people up there harvesting those fish, and we followed that all the way down to Alert Bay uh, through a series of inlets, and then from Alert Bay over to Nimkish Lake down the Nimkish Lake into Wass Lake and down Wass Lake to the height of land and over height of land down out to Friendly Cove and Nootka Island um, where we had a fantastic experience out there. So we did the whole Grease Trail as part of this uh, introductory sort of tourism lesson to the Willa Mola Accord. And it was absolutely fabulous to see uh, all the participants and uh, their eyes widened as three helicopters approached from the sky and settled down on the beaches and whatnot. And it was uh, very, very interesting indeed. So it was a very memorable occasion. Um, and every night we returned to uh, Nemo Bay for dinner and laughs and stories and all kinds of stuff. But that's what we're all about at Nemo Bay. So it was a very successful adventure. And I'm just hoping that uh, something will come of that. Um, like it was, like we did in, the, in that time. There you go, story number one. Story number two, part of the uh, people on board the helicopters is a, a lady by the name of Andy Ethel. <laughs> well, I was sitting with her. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and Ethel was 92 years old. And we landed up on the top of the Kinkin Glacier, 
and it was lunchtime up there, so we broke out the grub and started to have a great feast. And then at the end, gathered everything up, everybody back in the helicopter. And of course, at the edge of where we were eating, is a thousand foot drop down to the glacier itself. So we gave the key to the pilot, and uh, he just put his nose over the edge of that lunch spot and then dropped her straight down. And Andy Ethel, you could hear her scream from the back seat. And I think she lost about 15 years right there. She never felt so good in all her life. She had one hell of a trip. Well, actually, Craig, that was me screaming. <laughs> Andy Ethel was holding me and consoling me. Thank you. <laughs> so some of the fun stuff that can happen on, on those, on those uh, adventures. It was very fun. <laughs> Here you go, Bruce. All yours. Well, thanks for the uh, illustrations, Craig. You've always been able to make a splash and make a make an impression, and uh, and I think that's what makes your business great. Um, I guess what we could say in conclusion, uh, a couple of points that are pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, one is that, uh, as Walt told us, tourism is a large and growing industry, and that there is a large and growing demand for the First Nations culture for the Aboriginal tourism part of it. Uh, as we heard from Craig, business needs First Nations partners to connect with its market demand and to gain access to the resources that our business wants to, to succeed. As we heard from Lillian and on behalf of Randy, we learned that First Nations need business partners for finance, for expertise, and for access to those markets. Now, I'm not the smartest uh, guy in the world, but it seems to me that well, what we've got here is a clear opportunity for a win-win kind of a solution if we simply go forward with respect and good feeling to develop partnerships. And so I hope that you folks that are involved in economic development around the province will uh, take a look at the uh, uh, Willamilla Accord and similar kinds of agreements as ways for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities to work together so that we can all do better. Look forward to your questions, folks. Thank you so much, Craig and Lillian, for uh, those great stories and, uh, and sharing your experiences for that. And uh, Bruce, that was uh, a great wrap-up, I think. Thank you. So at this point, uh, folks, feel free to uh, type in your questions, either using the, uh, the text box uh, on your dashboard there, or you can uh, push that virtual raise a hand button, and that will let me know that you'd like to ask a, a verbal question to our presenters today. Uh, Walt, I'll invite you to turn your webcam on, just in case any questions come your way, and we've got a nice visual panel for our folks here today. And we do have a few in the queue already, so uh, I'm just going to start at the top. Uh, we've got a question here from Cameron who asks, uh, Walt, um, thoughts on international versus domestic visitors for Aboriginal experiences? Uh, in other words, would you recommend targeting Canadian, American, or foreign visitors with marketing in the next one to three years? Well, domestic is still our largest market, and I would suggest that that's probably the place to start. Having said that, though, we learn more about our uh, visitors every year and their propensity for Aboriginal experiences. So uh, while I would certainly concentrate on the domestic market, you can see the potential, too, from the likes of the U.S. and Europe. And as you recognize what Destination BC and Destination Canada are doing from a marketing perspective. If they're incorporating Aboriginal tourism experiences into their marketing, then it stands to reason you would want to uh, take advantage of that and certainly promote the Aboriginal product in your region to those international visitors. Great. Thanks, Walt. Uh, another question here from one of our colleagues with the uh, Ministry of Aboriginal uh, Relations and Reconciliation, uh, Teak. Uh, and this is probably a question for uh, Bruce, you, I would imagine, and, and maybe Walt, you can chime in on this. Um, but Teak is asking, what type of resources and funding have been put into research on the negative impacts of ecotourism as determined by the injection of contrasting external cultural influences and by the commodification that accompanies ecotourism development? Bit of a bit of a mouthful there. Uh, if you want me to read it out again one more time, uh, just let me know. Bruce, do you have any insight on I that? Did yeah. Um, it, only that uh, we do recognize the potential for tourism to be a negative force to 
uh, culture, particularly uh, culture in remote and rural communities where essentially city people come in and, and change the way the youth look at the world. Um, I, I will point out that that's happening because of the internet now. The, the, the impacts of tourism are, are less than they were in, say, the 1960s and 70s in terms of social uh, disruption. Um, the way that we are trying to address those concerns is primarily one of approaching development from a destination or community-based point of view. Uh, destination British Columbia launched this month a new process called Destination Development, where we'll be looking at clusters and, and corridors of communities and figuring out strategies to develop their tourism potential. But that's going to take into account the social environment of the local place so that those local folks have some degree of control over what happens to them. And that's probably, you're touching now on the topic of, of my own PhD uh, research, uh, that ability to have some control over what happens to you is, is probably central to communities feeling, feeling comfortable with tourism development. And it's exactly what Lillian and Craig were talking about. It's a question of respect. Business coming into a community has to come in respectfully and talk to the local people, talk to the Aboriginal community about what kind of tourism they would like to do and how they would like to do it. And I think if we go forward with that kind of respect uh, held honestly in our hearts, I think we can do well. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Another question here from uh, Jeanette, who's asking, uh, can the Willamola Accord be shared? If someone wanted to read that accord, where would they find it? Bruce, you got a copy of that. I do indeed. I'll, I will give a copy to Josh to post with our, uh, with our PowerPoint for this presentation. There Thank you go. There's your answer. Uh, at this point, not seeing any more questions in the queue or uh, a hand being raised, but maybe um, a question for, for Lillian. Uh, Lillian, if, uh, and, and this of course is generally speaking, and I imagine it would uh, you know, change from community to community, but if a tourism business um, wanted to do business in, uh, and, and, and with, with an Aboriginal community or in the traditional territory of, uh, of a First Nation, what would be the best way of, of going about that, to make that first step? Well, to find um, someone in the First Nation community to actually talk to, I think that going back in our history of the cultural tourism program development uh, at Umista Cultural Center only dates back to 2000. And when we developed that program and the phone started to ring, we were pleasantly surprised to find that, you know, so many um, inbound tour operators that were excited to have someone to connect with in the community. So the old-fashioned way back then was just searching around and looking for people. And in our case, um, the Umista Cultural Center was, was a good starting you know, a connection. And they were happy to be able to, to do that. So I think that if anybody, and, and, and how we work with uh, inbound tour operators today, I'm usually the um, first or second contact that people make when, they, when we're developing uh, a visit, a proposed visit. Great, thank you. And um, may I add to that, please? I, yeah. I wonder, Lillian, if it would be fair to say that uh, for a business person who doesn't have a direct contact in a community, that they could approach Aboriginal Tourism BC. Yeah, on our website, absolutely. That's a, a, a major connector. Great, thanks for that uh, that add-on, Bruce. And I suppose along a similar vein. Um, Lillian, in, in your advice, what would be uh, a faux pas that a business, uh, you know, could could do on on the first step? What's something that someone uh, certainly shouldn't do when uh, when when approaching a, a First Nations community to to do business in their territory? Well, um, I think that the first thing they shouldn't do is to show up unannounced. Okay. And, and, and going back to the other question that, you you know, the negative impacts, I think that, in, and we can relive this in Alert Bay, that was definitely some, some of the things that were happening at the time where tour operators and people were, uh, non-Aboriginal tour operators were bringing people and just plunking themselves in, in the village and wandering about on their own. So that's one of the first things we ide identified as what we don't want to happen. Great, thanks. 
Well, it seems that uh, all of your presentations were remarkably comprehensive because there don't seem to be too many questions coming in. It seems that uh, everyone's questions have been answered, and we do have quite a few folks on the line. So uh, I think maybe I'll just give it a, a couple more minutes for any last-minute questions to come in. But uh, in the meantime, did just want to extend sincere thanks um, to Craig and Lillian for taking time out of your day to uh, to present with us today. I know that Lillian, you need to do a bit of travel to get over to Craig's place, and we certainly had some technical issues getting things off the ground. So really appreciate your uh, your patience, Craig, with that, and uh, and Lillian for helping out. And again, a big thanks to Bruce for uh, gathering us all here today. Uh, appreciate your your expertise there. Um, Walt, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure you've got a very busy schedule as well, but certainly appreciated your uh, your insights and some of the statistics to really show how important um, Aboriginal tourism is to BC's economy and our, our overall tourism portfolio. So unless there's any uh, closing remarks from uh, uh, from any of our folks on the line, uh, any of our panelists, uh, I think we can wrap things up for today. Thank you. Hearing none? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Great. Josh. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time.